Praise God from Hello and welcome back to our final installment of our Central Church of Christ September series. We hope you've been blessed over the last several weeks by the great men we've had speak to our congregation and those in our community. Tonight we conclude with Greg McCord, longtime staple of our community and a minister of the Pinewood Church of Christ for nearly 30 years now. And we're thrilled to have him to conclude our series tonight. We hope you're blessed. We hope you're uplifted. We hope you're encouraged as we once again, for the final time, go face to face with Jesus. Well, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Wednesday evening Bible devotional with the Centerville Church of Christ. My name is Greg McCord, and I am really honored that the elders have asked me to be a part of this. And I cherish the years that I shared with Paul Rogers and Craig in the ministry. Tonight we'll be talking about the Samaritan woman at the well. It's in cha John chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 3. He left Judea and departed to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city in Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. And then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? A Samaritan woman, for the Jews and Samaritans have no dealings together. It was an odd-shaped tombstone, and Jason Wilkes had passed that area day after day on his way to work and on his way home. And he thought one of these days, when it's not rush hour traffic, one of these days when I have a little time, I want to stop and see what's on that tombstone. So he would stop. It was on July the 4th, 2011. He parked his car, got out, and he made his way to that stone. And on that stone it said, Grace Llewellyn Smith. There was no date of birth. There was no date of death listed. Just the names of two husbands in this epitaph. Sleeps, but rests not. Loved, but was loved not. Tried to please, but pleased not. She died as she lived, alone. Had she written those words, or had she lived those words? Did she deserve the pain? Did she deserve to feel beaten or bitter? I found myself asking after I read that, Miss Smith, what broke your heart? The lady walked across the sand and dust in the noonday sun. Her shoulders were stooped from the weight of the water jar. Her feet trudged heavily, stirring up the dust on the path. She keeps her eyes down so she can dodge the stares of those people that judge her. She is a Samaritan. She knows the sting of racism. She is a woman. She has been married, married to five men Five different marriages, five different rejections. She knows the sound of a slamming door. She knows what it means to love and receive no love in return. Her current mate won't even give her his name. He only gives her a place to sleep. If there's a Grace Llewellyn Smith in the New Testament, it would be this woman. The apathath of no significance would have been hers, and it would have been, 
except for an encounter with a stranger. On this particular day, she came to the well at noon. I think it's important to point out that this would have been a tremendous social time for the ladies of a village. Going together in the late evening or in the early morning to gather water. Well, that would give them time to visit, give them time to talk, and give them time just to be themselves around the other ladies. But on this day, this woman came to the well at noon. In the heat of the day, she came by herself. Maybe she was there early that morning. I don't know. Or maybe she just needed more water and was coming back. Or maybe not. Maybe she was avoiding the other women. So a walk in the hot sun was a small price to pay not to receive the barbs from their sharp tongues. Here she comes. Have you heard? She's got a new man. They'll be looking for another one again soon. Shh, shh, there she is. So she came to the well at noon. She expected silence. She expected solitude. Instead, she found one who knew her better than she knew herself. He was seated on the ground, his back resting against the well wall. His eyes were closed. She stopped and looked at him. She looked around. Nobody was near. She looked back at him. He was obviously a Jew. What was he doing here? His eyes opened and her eyes ducked in embarrassment. She quickly went about her task. Sensing a little bit of discomfort, Jesus asked her for some water. But she was too streetwise to think that that man was just asking for a drink. She wanted to know what he was really up to, what he really had in mind. Her intuition was partly correct because he was interested in more than water. He was interested in her heart. They talked. Who could remember the last time a man had spoken to her with respect? He told her about a spring of water that would quench not only the thirst of the throat, but the thirst of a soul. That kind of intrigued her. Sir, will you give me that water so I'll never get thirsty again? Will you give me that water so I'll never have to come back out here make this water trip again? Then Jesus said, Go, call your husband and come back. Her heart must have sunk. Here was a Jew who didn't care if she was a Samaritan. Here was a man who didn't look down on her because she was a woman. Here was someone that is the closest thing to gentleness she had seen in a long, long time. And now he was asking her about, about that. Anything but that. I don't know, maybe she considered lying. Oh, my, my husband, he's just real busy. He, he's at work, he can't come. Maybe she wanted to change the subject. Maybe she wanted to leave, but she stayed. She stayed and told the truth. I have no husband. Kindness has a way of making people want to be honest. You probably know the rest of the story. I kind of wish you didn't tonight. I wish you were hearing this for the very first time. For if you were, You'd be wide-eyed as you waited to see what Jesus would do next. 
Why? Because we want to do the same thing. We've wanted at times to take off our mask. We've wanted at times to stop pretending. You wonder what God would do if you opened up that old, old closet door of all your seemingly secrets. The woman wondered what Jesus would do. She must have wondered if all that kindness he was showing at start would evaporate when she revealed. Will he be angry? Will he leave? Will he think I'm worthless? If you've got some of those same anxieties, get your pencil out, and I want you to underline Jesus' answer. You're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with, he won't even give you a name. No criticism, no anger, no what kind of mess you've made of your life lectures. No, it, it wasn't perfection that Jesus was seeking. He was looking for honesty. The woman was amazed. I see that you're a prophet. Translation, I can see there's something different about you. Uh, do you mind if I ask you something? And then the question she asked to try to reveal that and fill that gaping hole in her soul. Where is God? Where is God? Some people say He is on the mountain. Your people say He's in Jerusalem. I don't know where he is. Of all the places to find a hungry heart, in Samaria? Of all the Samaritans be searching for God, a woman? Of all the women to have an appetite for God, a five-time divorcee, and of all the people to be chosen to personally receive the secret of ages, an outcast among outcasts, the most insignificant person in the region. It's kind of remarkable. Jesus didn't reveal his secret to King Herod. He didn't request an audience with the Sanhedrin and tell them the news. It wasn't within the walls of a Roman court that he announced his identity. No. It was in the shade of a well in rejected land to an outcast woman. His eyes must have danced as he whispered that secret. I am the Messiah. The most important phrase in the chapter is easily overlooked. And I want to share that with you. The woman left her water jar beside the well and went back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this possibly be the Messiah? John 4, 28 and 29. Don't miss the drama of that, of that time. Don't miss the significance of that moment. Listen to her as she, she struggles with the words. Are, 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 are you the Messiah? And watch as she scrambles to her feet, taking one last look at the Nazarene, then turns and ran back towards the village, back to her hometown. Did you notice what she forgot? The Bible tells us she forgot her water jar. She left behind the jug that caused her shoulders to sag. She left behind the burden that she had brought. Suddenly the shame of those messed up 
relationships disappeared. Suddenly the insignificance of her life was swallowed by the significance of the moment. God is here. God has come. And God cares for me. That's why she forgot that water jar. That's why she ran to the city. That's why she grabbed the first person and she saw and announced, I just talked to a man who told me everything that I ever did. Told me everything that I had ever been involved with. And he loved me anyway. He loved me anyway. His disciples offered Jesus some food, but he refused it. He was too excited about the moment. He was more involved in that moment than, than, than eating. He had just done what he does best. He had taken a life that was just out there drifting and had, had no real purpose. And he had given that drifting life some direction. Look, he announced to the disciples, pointing at the woman who's running to the village, vast fields of human beings are ripening all around us and they're ready for reaping. For some of you, the story touches distance. You're needed to know and you know that you're needed. You've got more friends than you can visit, more tasks than you can accomplish. Insignificant will not be chiseled on your tombstone. Be thankful. But, but maybe there's some others that are different. They paused and looked at that Epitaph, because it could easily be theirs. You see, the face of Grace Smith, when you look into their eyes, you know why the Samaritan woman was avoiding people, and they do the very same thing. A prayer to do what God does best. Take the common and make it spectacular to once again take the rod and divide the sea, to take a pebble and kill Goliath, take water and make it into sparkling wine, take a peasant boy's lunch and feed the crowd, take mud and restore the eyes and sight of a blind man and take three spikes and a wooden beam and make them our hope. Not only our hope, but the hope for all humanity. And take that rejected woman and make her into a missionary. I'm amazed at what it tells me when that woman went back to the city she told everybody that she could. She told everyone. And the Bible tells us that many Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word the woman testified to them. He told me all that I ever did. Here was a, a, a lady of, of really insignificant value. And through her contact with Jesus, it changed her whole perspective. It changed her whole life. She became something that day. She became someone special. Not only in the eyes of Christ, she was always that. But in her own eyes, she became someone that had a worthy life. Just by that contact, face-to-face -face contact with Jesus, 
she became something special. There are two graves as I wrap up this evening. Two graves in this lesson. The first one is the lonely one at the Lock Hill Cemetery. The grave of Grace Llewellyn Smith. She knew not love. She knew not gratification. She only knew pain. And that was chiseled into her stone. Sleeps, but rests not. Loved, but was loved not. Tried to please, but pleased not. Died as she lived, alone. That, however, was not the only grave we discussed tonight. The second grave is found near the water well. The tombstone, it was that water jug. It was that forgotten water jug. It has no words on it, but it has great significance for it's the burial place of insignificance. The burial place of insignificance. I close with this scripture. John chapter 4. 28 through 30 and then 39. The woman left her water part, pot and went way into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man, a man who told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Verse 39, And many Samaritans of that city believed in him, because the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Jesus loved her, even knowing all she'd done. Sometimes we might think, there's no way God could love me. Because see, I, I, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand the, the mess I've made of my life. There's no way God could love me. That's the same dusty path this woman had walked day after day after day. And then finally one day, one day, she came in contact with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And from that day, I believe with all my heart, from that day, she became someone special, an ambassador for the Messiah just because of that contact she had made. Let's close with a prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much, dear God, for all the blessings that you give us. We're so thankful, dear God, that we can share your word Although at this time we can't be together, we can still be together in spirit and share your word. Dear God, we ask tonight that you be with those that are suffering with the virus. We pray, dear God, you will bless them. We pray, pray dear God, you will help them to be made better. We pray, dear God, that those that, that are suffering will get some relief be made well again. Dear God, we pray that the virus will soon be gone. We pray, dear God, that we will be eyes opened all the time, looking for that, that person, dear God, that just needs someone to love them. That person, dear God, that just needs a sense of direction. That proverbial woman at the well that just says, someone tell me you care no matter what I've done. That's what Jesus would say. That's what Jesus would do. And dear God, it's our prayer that we'll be more like Christ in the days to come.
Strengthen us and love us. Dear God, we just pray that your church will grow. We pray, dear God, that, that we as Christians will reach out to others that are searching, searching, dear God, for that sense of direction. Thank you so much for this time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A special thank you to Coach McCord for his great lesson to us tonight. A thank you to him, Kevin Johnston, Mickey Mathis, Brent Beard, and Mike Kelly for being a part of our series this month. We hope you have enjoyed hearing from these men, and we hope that you take what they have taught us and can apply it in your life in some way. We thank you again for being a part of our evening and a part of our month here, and we invite you to come and be with us at any point in time that you are able to do so. May God be with you until we meet again. Yeah.